So this will just take about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, first of all, I want to give some thanks. Uh, there was an organizing committee, Ramsey, Garth, and Christos uh, were the organizing committee. Uh, this is, this. <laughs> And, uh, and they you know, helped us with the, a lot of the ideas here. But, uh, but huge thanks to the local arrangements <laughs> committee. Uh, it's it's uh, the amount of work that went into this is just uh, astounding. The uh, I I had I was both in charge of the PAR lab and the amp and the RAD lab at the same time. So most of these people reported to me. And uh, so I wanted to tell them before I told the world that I was going to retire. And so when I brought them together and I said, hey, well, I'm going to retire. And so Roxanne said, how big a party can we throw? <laughs> <laughs> and so these guys have been doing retreats twice a year for decades, right? So, the, 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 so I kind of like kind of doing good for others helps yourself. So they, I kind of had them prepare for my party for a decade. <laughs> but they did a huge amount of work. So I and it really, I'm going to remember this all my life. And so I really appreciate what you've done. And I, I can't imagine uh, that you're, uh, you knew what you were getting involved in <laughs> to do this. So thanks. OK. So uh, So the, the thing I didn't have time to do yesterday was my life story and lessons learned. So I'm, I'm going give to you, give you that. So uh, I'm an accidental computer science student. Uh, I was a wrestler uh, in high school and college. This is my uh, brother and sister on my shoulders. I think I can still do that. <laughs> and I was part of a, a state champion team. That's me in the middle, the short guy in the middle, and then my uh, best friend, Rich Byrne, who's in the back. And he was on uh, my high school team and, uh, and uh, my college wrestling team together. And I was a math major. And uh, I had, uh, and the first of my uh, family to graduate from college, I had, oh, I knew kind of what computers were, but I had no thoughts of computers. I kind of, I had a really good math teacher, and he wanted to be an actuary. So when people said, uh, what, Ask me, I would just say what my high school teacher said, an actuary. For those of you who don't know what an actuary is, I, the, de the definition is an actuary is an accountant without the scintillating personality. <laughs> <laughs> but in the last quarter of my junior year at UCLA, a math class was canceled. Uh, and so there was this class, a computer class, it was called Coding an Automatic Digital Computer, a two-unit class. It was only half a class. Uh, and it's a lower division class, but I took that class, and this is punch cards and Fortran and line printer listings, uh, you know, one day turnaround every time you do that. But I was hooked once I did that. It's like magic, you know, the stuff in your brain comes alive. And in my senior year, I took 10 courses, and seven of them were various computer courses at the business school or engineering. There was no undergraduate degree, but that, that was, I, I found my, the thing that I wanted to do. So uh, I, became, I started being be my own computer science student. I was an accidental graduate student at UCLA. Jean Loubert, are you still here, Jean Loubert? He was here yesterday. This is what he looked like a, little, a few years ago. He had just finished his PhD at UCLA and he was applying for jobs, so he taught a class. And this was in the winter quarter of my senior year, so three months before I graduated. And at the end of the class, I was working at my dad's factory. Uh, supporting uh, myself, paying for my way through college. And uh, I said to them completely innocently at the end of the class, boy, I'd sure be rather doing this, you know, the, the, the software stuff, the computer science stuff, rather than working in a factory, get my way through school. And I didn't, yeah, that's all I said. So he went on his own and he went and visited several research projects and found a job for me uh, as an undergraduate. So I, I was able to work at UCLA rather than downtown LA. And then, uh, it was, uh, back then, I guess it was late enough, I really enjoyed it, and so I talked to my wife, and I said, I think I'd like to go to graduate school, and a master's degree seems pretty cost effective, so uh, I did that. Uh, I, I planned to do that, and then in the office I was in, everybody in my office, uh, there was four of us in the office, and the other three were getting PhDs, so that seemed like a pretty good idea, <laughs> so, so that's how I got to graduate school. The same time that uh, he offered that to me, I had my very last wrestling match uh, in, in, as an undergraduate, as a senior, and the very last period of the very last minute, I felt something pop in my, my knee. Now, I'd known a lot of wrestlers with knee problems, and they had these big Frankenstein uh, scars on their knees at the time. This was before arthroscopic surgery. 
So I didn't think that much about it, but I kind of walked around with a limp. Well, you know, three months later, I got drafted. This was during the Vietnam War. And I went into the induction center at, at uh, downtown Los Angeles, and they said, well, this guy was going to leave for lunch. Anybody got any problems? I said, yeah, my, well, my knee's sore, right? So he measured my right thigh and then he, my left thigh, which was my bad knee, and it was smaller, and he gave me a deferment. And so, you know, I can't imagine I would have uh, gone, been drafted and gone back to graduate school. I can't imagine that would have happened. I had, uh, my first son was born, so if I hadn't injured my knee, I, I, I'm sure I wouldn't have gone to graduate school. So what happened, actually, right after I got the deferment, I started riding my bicycle back and forth between UCLA and married student housing, and that built up the muscles around my knee. So then I started playing football, and I played on the rugby team at UCLA, so I was perfectly fine after that. But for that one window, that terrible crisis, it kept me, it kept me from being drafted. So that was one of those things that makes me think that one of my ancestors has been looking out for me. So we worked as graduate students on a 20-hour a week RA. So my wa- and we lived in married student housing, and I supported my wife and uh, two sons. And that's we were poor. You know, we didn't couldn't afford to have a car. Uh, all our clothing was used. But you know, the nice thing about it is my wife and I, I think, still know that we could be happy if we were poor because we were very happy then. So. Uh, I lost my RA ship. Uh, it, it, it grand ended, so I had to find a job, and my advisor helped got me a part-time job at Hughes Aircraft. I had been mostly a software person, taking a few hardware classes, but at Hughes Aircraft, we built uh, computers for uh, airborne computers. In fact, if, uh, for those of you who know this, we actually built a wafer-scale integrated computer, so the only one I ever known. So that instead of dicing up chips, the, com- the wafer was the computer. But that's how I learned to do hardware. Uh, I'm an accidentally Berkeley professor. Uh, I, I know now, I learned recently that uh, Berkeley had tried to hire Doug Clark, who uh, went on to uh, turn Berkeley down. Berkeley had just had this merger of the two departments, so there was some rancor there, and I guess that scared him away. My wife, Linda, uh, grew up near Berkeley and loved Northern California, always hoped that we would go back there. So as a graduate student at UCLA, she forced me to call the chair of the department at UCLA to find out my application. And that was Elwin Burlicamp. So I, you know, I had a job at Bill Labs, and she said, you know, we got it, you got to call him. So, okay, screwed up my courage, called him on the phone. I still remember having my finger in the ear and said, well, you know, Berkeley's the one place I haven't heard of that I would still consider, otherwise I'm going to go to Bell Labs. So Elwin Burlicamp, what do you say to me? Well, Dave, you're in the top 10, but not the top five, so it's not going to work out. And so I thought, I was completely relieved. Oh, that wasn't so bad. I humiliated myself. My wife made me do that. So what happened? I found out later, he said that to anybody who called. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but he took my app out in an application. It looked kind of interesting. And uh, Al Despain, who was an associate professor at the time, was visiting Southern California. So as long as he was going there, he dropped by and talked to me. We had a good conversation. They invited me and, uh, you know, and they, from there. The first project was led by Aldous Spain. This was the X Street project. Uh, Gordon Hamachi here, he still has an X Street t-shirt, is incredibly ambitious. Uh, super, uh, parallel computer, build our own operating system, and we had no funding, no resources or anything. Amazingly enough, and I know it was a good idea, I took a sabbatical three years into my assistant professorship at DEC, and it gave me three months or four months to think about how to do research. And so I came back, how to do research at universities and whether it made sense what we're doing. So I came back and started tying research to courses because those are real deadlines and inviting people from Silicon Valley and we did the risk work and then everything uh, worked out pretty well after that. But uh, that, that's the true story. But so what's works for me? Uh, family first. Uh, I, I think it was actually Aldo Spain when one late night meeting he comes in and I think he said, gee, you know, I wish, he told me, I wish, uh, Wish I, if I had to do it over again, I wish I'd spend more time with the kids, right? And I never wanted to say that. <laughs> I never wanted to say that. And yeah, I think get my strong family there. It was, I think I came into it with family first. So what did that mean? That meant I have two sons. That meant I did Indian guides. I was the Cub Den leader. Uh, I was the assistant soccer coach. And I went on the field trips and stuff. And so when my, my rebellious teenager, son, beautiful kids became rebellious teenagers, uh, when they said, oh, dad, you were never around when we were growing up. Okay. Indian guides, Cub Scouts, <laughs> assistant soccer. <laughs> so I said, oh, okay, well, maybe you were around. <laughs> I was ready for that. Uh, the uh, passion and courage, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a pa- passionate guy, and ironically, 
the physical courage that you get from wrestling translated into intellectual courage. So I feel that it's my personal responsibility to stand up in some kind of intellectual change when something's not right and confront whatever it is, whether it's political correctness or people doing bad things. That's why I, uh, when Lazowska, when there was this guy in charge of DARPA who was damaging the field, I think, okay, I got to stand up. And fortunately, Ed Lazowska joined me in that. So, but I'm passionate. I like to think, like in Star Trek terms, uh, that's what Randy talked about as an example. I like to think I'm kind of like Jean-Luc Picard, you know. <laughs> I see. <laughs> I, I even look like him some. I look, but uh, the reality is I'm more like Captain Kirk. <laughs> and I get all worked up and uh, so. But as a result of that, that means the projects that we do, you know, we swing for the fences, right? We're, we got to believe that we can change the world. You know, we're, we're, we think we can do that. And so that's what we try to do, projects that could change what we're doing, change everything doing. Lot Vizada, our senior colleague, told me this saying. It's actually a couple hundred years old. But friends come and go, but enemies accumulate. <laughs> So that's true in my life. So friends, you know, you, you be friends and then you kind of drift apart. And you know, oh, yeah, I kind of remember, you know, we used to do things together. Enemies never forget. Right? <laughs> they don't stop being your enemy. So I think I, I think in my career I got exactly two enemies. One of them was that DARPA director. And yeah, they, they, they stick with you your, your whole life. So, you know, if you're going to just if you're going to make an enemy, just take, make it carefully. You, they're never going to go away. Uh, you know, I think if that you can pick enemies that everybody else hates, so that can work, but it's careful. <laughs> uh, winning as a team versus individual, I think this is just in my DNA. I think ironically, wrestling, I was talking to another wrestler about this. Wrestling is an individual sport, but I was blessed with a great high school coach and college coach who believed that the team would be more successful if we could get these individuals to all bond together as a team. As unlike, you know, it'd be easier in a basketball team or something like that. But I think that helped me. And I, that's how I learned to do team stuff from my, from my coaches. Uh, I, you know, and part of that mantra is there's no uh, losers on a winning team, no winners on a uh, losing team. And I believe if we win, you know, everybody wins who's involved. Seek out honest feedback and learn from it. I think that's one of the things I'm good at is going around and, and if somebody really doesn't like what we're doing, I make sure they read our paper and uh, tell us what they think about it. Now, one of the things I can pass along from 40 years is the absolute sure danger sign in my career is if somebody thinks they're the smartest person in the room, run away, okay? So the, four, the examples in my life, there's a person who's an architect like Burton Smith and, my, and I in our field, and he thinks he's the smartest person in the room, and everybody hates that guy. Just everybody hates that guy. So there's the next one's uh, Ivy League president of a president of an Ivy League university who thought he was the smartest person in the room. He was fired from the job. So the uh, Enron, the energy company, that's the title of the book was The Smartest People in the Room. The founder and the, and the uh, CEO of Enron were both convicted felons, right? And I actually have a relative of one of my brothers-in-laws who thought he was the smartest person in the room. He is also a convicted felon, right? <laughs> so, how could this be? How could it be some people who think they're the smartest people in the room all be such disasters? It's, they, it's not that they're not smart, they probably are smart. It's that they think they're the smartest person in the room. And I think what it means is there's no reason to get any feedback on their ideas. If you're the smartest person in the room, what are you going to learn from talking to somebody not as smart as you? So they think they know what they're doing, don't get any feedback when they're doing this jump ahead and bad things happen. So, but trust me, if you've learned about somebody, just run away, uh, you'll be happy. <laughs> Uh, one big thing at a time. I can still remember, like, say, 10 years into, into the career, uh, it's like I woke up in the morning, it was a sunny day, and it was like God whispered in my ear. It's not how many projects you start, it's how many you finish. And it's kind of an obvious thing to say, but it, re it was like I was thunderstruck. And after that, every, I would only do one big thing at a time. I do multiple things, but I do one big thing at a time. So when Hennessy Rowling wrote our textbook, that was the one big thing I did. Uh, when I was president of ACM, I did a sabbatical. That was the one big thing I did. Uh, when I did the Richard Tapia conference, that was the one big thing. So, and it turns out, uh, because a lot of academics particularly don't do one big thing at a time, they do lots of things, they don't get most of them done. Uh, and if and I'm around for 30 or 40 years, I do one big thing a year for 30 or 40 years, I get a lot of things done. <laughs> and so people think I'm productive. I think it's just more I'm, uh, I'm selective. And then, uh, and you'll have to ask my mom about this, but I'm just a natural born optimist. I just came out of that way. My, I think uh, my favorite book, 
growing up was the little engine that could. <laughs> or that made a giant imprint on me. So my story about that is when I'm in high school and, uh, uh, you know, and I am going, I've, I'm dating this girl. Uh, we've gone on a couple of dates and at the time uh, she had dated older guys, guys with Corvettes. I had a Vespa, but you know, <laughs> And she, and she wasn't that excited about you know going steady because you know she was she was only 16 years old, but after a couple of dates I screw up my courage and I say, "Would you go steady with me?" And so she says to me, thinking uh, you know feeling sorry for me, "Well, I don't know how to say no." And to me, as an optimist and a logical person, <laughs> you know, not a no sounds like a yes. So I said, "Great," and I hug her. <laughs> so. Uh, she thought, y'all yeah, let me go, but you know, we've been together 50 years, <laughs> so <laughs> she has let me go. Yeah. And with that, I close the symposium and my 40 year career at Berkeley. Thank you. This, this, this has been so much fun. Uh, it, I, I, the great thing about this is there, I got to draft a dozen people to give talks. And weren't, weren't these amazing talks? <laughs> and, uh, and they all said yes. So I've decided I'm going to retire every year. So thank you very much. <laughs>